Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace and Allah's mercy be upon you. Welcome to Universal Quran. Alhamdulillah, all praise belongs to Allah alone. Wa salat wa salam ala Rasulillah. And we pray for Allah's blessing and peace upon His Messenger and Prophet Muhammad. In Universal Quran, we examine the Holy Book of Islam, the scripture that was revealed 1,400 years ago, that was sent by to the Prophet Muhammad, who was sent as a mercy to all of the worlds, all of humanity. And so the Qur'an is truly a universal book, a universal revelation, which is good for all times and all places. But it's very important that we understand the nature of the Qur'an and how to learn from it, how to read it, and, and draw knowledge and insight from its verses. Because it was revealed in the original Arabic language, the classical Arabic, we have to be aware of the meanings of that language. And if we ourselves aren't able to study that language in depth, then we have to be guided by the scholars of the Arabic language as to the original intent of those verses. Secondly, the Prophet himself explicated many verses of the Qur'an, specifically in his sunnah, in the hadith, or the explanations of the Prophet's life and his words and deeds. And he told us and lived for us what the Qur'an means. And so we have to look at those things from his sunnah which teach us about the meaning of the Holy Qur'an. And that is the correct methodology. And that way we can derive universal laws and principles that we can apply to our own lifetime with Allah's help. Uh, we're on almost finishing with the final section of the Holy Qur'an. This is Juz Thalatin, the 30th section of the Holy Qur'an. Today we're going to be... Uh, Reading chapters 105 and 106, Al Fil and Quraysh. Uh, we have our brother Fayruz from Singapore, and he's been a student of the Quran and memorized the Quran and does an excellent job for us uh, giving his reading of the verses in the original language. And then Bilal, who is a good friend of ours from Canada, will follow up with the English interpretation. So uh, if you could please read the first two verses of this short chapter. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بأصحاب الفيل ألم يجعل كيدهم في تضليل I seek refuge with Allah from Shaitan the outcast. In the name of Allah, the most gracious and most merciful. Have you not seen how your Lord dealt with the owners of the, of the elephant? Did he not make their plot go astray? These verses were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad in Mecca when he was, of course, disputing with the leaders of Mecca who depended upon the pilgrimage to the house of, of, of Allah SWT in Mecca as their means of support and livelihood. And it also caused them to be honored among their people so they could be the richest and most prominent people in Arabia. And Allah is reminding them of His blessings to Mecca and to this sacred house and that they therefore owe their worship to their Lord who saved this house from destruction by the companions of the elephant. Uh, the actual event which is taking place, which is being described in this verse, was an historical event. It actually took place on the year that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam was born, just before he was born. He was born in the year of the elephant, uh, which is approximately 570 of our current calendar. Uh, if you remind, remember in Surah Al-Buruj, we talked about the fact that in Yemen was a, a, a king, Bun Nawaz, who persecuted early followers of the teachings of Christ and caused them to be burnt alive for their faith. He was the last king of the Himyarites and he wished to impose his 
beliefs on all the people of Yemen, but after his death, they wrote to the Caesar who lived in Constantinople to send a Christian to rule over them. Caesar, in return, wrote to the king of Ethiopia, and he sent uh, Abraha as one of his generals to be the governor over Yemen. And Abraha was a very violent and evil man. And he wished, and he was to distract people from worshiping at Allah's house in Mecca. The Arabs would come and pray at the Kaaba and make their pilgrimage to Mecca every year, as has been done since the time of Abraham. And Abraha was jealous that the Arabs would go there. So he built a huge church called al Quleis in Yemen, in Sana'a, which is until this day the capital of Yemen. It was a, the biggest structure that had ever been built in Arabia, a very high uh, 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 church, lofty church, and he wanted everybody to make pilgrimage there instead of going to Mecca. But the Quraysh insulted that church, and in fact some people went and actually uh, relieved themselves, defecated or urinated on the side of the building to show that they, dis they disparaged it and despised this building and would not make the pilgrimage to al Quleis. And so Abra Abraha was angry and he raised an army and he had a, a huge elephant which was called Mahmud, the biggest elephant which he, he, he rode on personally as well as other elephants. Some sources say in total there were 13 elephants, others say there were 9, 11. Anyway, there were quite a few elephants uh, and particularly these elephants were used to frighten horses and camels, to frighten foot soldiers but for a specific reason, that he went down to Mecca with the idea of tying chains on each elephant, hooking them to the corners of the Kaaba, and having them pull simultaneously in different directions and causing the whole structure to collapse, and thereby, thereby divert people from making pilgrimage to that building and letting them make the annual pilgrimage to Sana'a, to the capital of Yemen, to his church. Abraha went down to, uh, brought his army, a huge army, and they proceeded toward Mecca, some tribes resisted, but they were defeated. And so people started joining with the tribe of, uh, with the army of Abraha until they re got outside of Mecca. Uh, Mecca at that time was one of the prominent people was Abdul Muttalib, who's the grandfather of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abdul Muttalib at that time, of course, was a young, uh, handsome person. He was also a very wealthy trader. He went to negotiate. Uh, one thing is that the army from Yemen captured uh, more than 200 of Abdul Muttalib's camels, and so he wanted his camels back. And so they agreed to give them back. But he didn't negotiate about not destroying the Kaaba, the house of Allah that was built by Abraham. And so Abraha said, I was impressed by you, how you look and how you act and how you talk, but all you're interested in are your camels, and you're not interested in protecting your religion and the house of your God. And Abdul Muttalib said, well, I am the lord of those camels, I'm their owner, and that house has its Lord, its owner, and he will protect it. And so he couldn't do anything to save uh, the Kaaba, and he told the people of Mecca to go up into the mountain, on top of the mountains, and stay up there. And as the camels got closer to Mecca, uh, actually in a place which is very close to Muzdalifa, on the way from uh, coming from the direction of Taif in the east toward Mecca, or yeah, in the east toward Mecca. Uh, the next verse is what actually happened to them took place. Let's read the, the next... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, did you say the camels were making their way or was it the elephants? The elephants and, and, uh, and of course, I'm sure the people were on camels, but yeah, the elephants. <laughs> the whole army. Three through five. وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلٌ تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّن سِجِّيلٌ and sent against them birds and flocks, striking them with stones of baked clay, and made them like an empty field of stalks. So when these events, I have to remind you that these are historical events. This was the year the Prophet wasallam was born. And so uh, when these verses were revealed, it had happened only perhaps a little over 40 years previously. So many, many people alive in Mecca at that time remembered these events uh, exactly as they're described here. And so nobody said, Oh, Muhammad, you're lying. Your Quran isn't true. These things didn't happen. But actually, even though it sounds fantastic, they knew very well that these things happened. That Allah saved 
the house that had been built by Abraham, devoted to the worship of Allah. He saved it from being destroyed by the elephant and by the army of Abraha by a miraculous event. And Allah said that he sent against them birds in flocks, flocks of birds which came from the direction of the sea, which came from the west. Now, what type of birds were they? Well, the narrators say that these were swallows and nightingales, very small birds, something that's not scary sounding, very innocent, small birds. <clears throat> But we understand from this, these verses and from the description of them in the tafsir, from the narrations which come from the Sahaba and the, and uh, the early generations. Exist? Sorry. It sounds like, as and we only Allah knows best, it sounds like they're the real kind of birds that still exist. When you go to the Kaaba today, uh, especially at night when the lights are on, you see all those swallows going round and round the Kaaba, hundreds and hundreds of them, day and night, they're, they're there. And you can still see them. And it sounds to us that those are the same kind of birds, but Allah knows best. It could have been a special kind of bird created for Him as a miracle, and nobody knows. Allah knows best. Uh, But anyway, they carried in their beaks and in their claws uh, stones of baked clay, as it says here. Sijil means baked, like bricks are clay, which are baked in a hot fire till they become hard. So these hard stones of baked clay, uh, they would each have three, one in the beak and one in each claw. And they dropped these upon the army of Abraha. The elephants refused to go toward Kaaba. Mahmud, the largest elephant, would, every time they would face him in any direction, he would go. But if they faced him toward Mecca, he would kneel down and stop. But these things uh, 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 frightened the elephants, and most of the elephants ran away who were not hit by them and, and, uh, and collapsed to the ground. Everybody who was hit by one, not everybody was hit, but everybody who was hit by one of these uh, stones, uh, his skin would break out in pox, and eventually the different organs and stuff would start falling off. Some of them died instantly as they were there, and others fled, including Abraha himself, who fled toward Yemen, and he was actually died on his way toward Yemen. And in fact, it's narrated that this was the first time that measles and smallpox appeared among the people of Mecca at this incident. And so from this reason, some modern commentators try to interpret these verses as not being literal that there weren't literally any birds that could be seen, but it was just the germs of these diseases and that the army was decimated by an outbreak of smallpox or an outbreak of some other kind of disease that caused their skin to fall off. And Allah knows best, but uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't believe the literal interpretation of these verses. And Allah knows best how He created those creatures, how He made those those rocks, and how the rocks caused disease to break out among the army. But in any case, it was a miraculous event, and it was witnessed by the thousands of people in Mecca who were up on top of the mountains and witnessed these events. And when the Prophet ﷺ, 40 years later, uh, brought this surah that was revealed to him, of course, they realized right away that Allah was saying to them, see how I have favored you and helped you in the past, and you must therefore be grateful and worship me alone, the one who is the Lord of the Kaaba, who built this structure by, my, by Allah's Allah's command. And so that's all we have time for. We'll go for a break and we'll come back and read chapter 106 of Quraysh. <laughs> Back to the Prophet. Join Sheikh Amar in the program Back to the Prophet, wherein he teaches us practical lessons from the Prophet's life and how this can help us to overcome our challenges in the present. We talk about the life example of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, seeking guidance for ourselves. In the early days after the revelation of the Holy Quran, the Muslims were greatly persecuted, so much so that quite a few Muslims had to leave Arabia and migrate to Africa to live among Ahl Kitab, Christian people who followed the Gospel of Christ. Welcome back to Universal Quran. 
Before the break, we were reading from chapter 105, Al-Fil, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded the people of Mecca how He had protected them when they were attacked and people had meant to destroy the holy Kaaba, the house of Allah that was built by Abraham in the valley of Mecca. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that just as I have protected this place in the past uh, and have made your lives good, so you should worship me alone. And that continues the same theme in the next chapter, Quraysh, a very short chapter which is very, very um, uh, much a continuation of the theme of the previous chapter. And uh, I'll ask uh, Brother Fabrus just to read the, the entire chapter, please. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لإيلاف قريش إيلافهم رحلة الشتاء والصيف فليعبدوا رب هذا البيت الذي أطعمهم من جوع وآمنهم من خوف. I seek refuge with Allah from Shaytan the outcast, in the name of Allah the most gracious, the most merciful, for the customary accord of Quraysh, their customary accord for the winter and summer caravan. So let them worship the Lord of this house who has fed them against hunger and has made them safe from fear. So after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reminded them of this miraculous event in which He saved the holy house of Mecca from destruction, He reminds them of all of the secure arrangements which He has made for the people who live in proximity to the Kaaba and the holy mosque of Mecca. And so He reminds them about this customary accord a grant of security and safety and protection from Allah which He has given to Mecca and the people who reside in the holy city of Mecca. And so it's a grace and protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the ilaf, which is that they uh, love each other, are attached to each other. They love the holy mosque and they're attached to it. And the mosque has uh, allowed them to live in peace and security and to be successful. Because they're the people who dwell near the holy places, people have always venerated them. Not only the ones who are actually descendants of Abraham and Ismail, but everybody who lives there are given uh, veneration and uh, uh, respect from the people. And so the Arab tribes were well known that they would fight with each other constantly. And if anybody traveled with their caravan of goods to be traded and traveled on their camel caravans uh, from one place to another and pass through the territory of any Arab tribe, that tribe would threaten the caravan unless you paid them some money for protecting, for protecting you and allowing you to traverse their territories. And so people were always having to travel long distances. In the desert, of course, the camel is the ideal form of transportation. Allah has made it and He has reminded us in the Quran of its miraculous creation where it can travel long distances without water and it can, uh, it's not bothered by stepping on thorns and rocks and it can even eat the thorny cactuses and plants that grow in the desert and derive nourishment that no other animal would be nourished by those kind of plants. And so Allah gave them veneration and respect in the eyes of people so that if Quraysh passed through and their caravans passed through the territories of other tribes, people would respect it and let them go. And so the Quraysh were able to become the number one traders and businessmen in the whole of Arabia, this whole huge you know, thousand miles of territory. And so it was their custom every summer to send a caravan to the, the south and in, uh, to the north and, and, and in, the, in, the, um, uh, in the winter to send it to the south to Yemen. So in Yemen was produced the incense and perfumes that are used to uh, in temples and churches and mosques and by in people's homes throughout the world. So they would send the caravan uh, in winter to Yemen and it would come back with all of those goods. And then they would go and trade that uh, in the, in the uh, 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 summer by going to Palestine and Syria, the borders of Sham, as it is called, that area of the world. 
and they would trade for all the fabrics that are made there, the, the valuable fabrics that are woven in Syria and Palestine and that area of the world. And so they became the, the strongest, richest, most successful tribe for only one reason, that is that Allah had bestowed the grace of the Kaaba upon them and they were given uh, security and peace to live there and yet they owed something to Allah SWT in return. And that comes from the next verse, verse 3, فَلْيَعْبُدُوا Therefore, because Allah has granted them security, Allah has miraculously saved them from their enemies, Allah has protected them from a huge army and destroyed that army in a great sign of His power and His care for the holy house of Mecca, because He has allowed you to live in security, to be respected and venerated and to love each other and to love the Kaaba and to love Allah's house, then you owe it to the Lord of that house to worship Him and worship Him alone. So let them worship the Lord of this house who has given them to eat. They Once again, uh, Abraham established this house at the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a valley in which there had never been any agriculture. There was no water. There was no food. And yet food comes to them from everywhere. They became very wealthy. And they were able to trade their, their money for food that was grown by other people and yet have plenty left over and who protected them from fear as when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a great army against them with uh, great uh, beasts whom they had never seen before. None of them have ever even seen an elephant. It's not a native animal to Arabia and it was frightening to them and to their uh, camels and horses and, and drove them away and yet Allah protected them and made them secure. This holy place of Makkah is Still, al balad al-Amin, as Allah also reminded us in Surah At-Teen, that it is a protected sanctuary where Muslims still come from all over the world to worship there, stand close to the holy places, remember uh, Allah's care and grace upon them by revealing the holy Qur'an uh, to the Prophet Muhammad in Mecca and follow in the footsteps of Abraham and the footsteps of Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon them, uh, in the rites of the pilgrimage, and the sacrifices which are made in the Hajj, in the holy pilgrimage, the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. And so Allah has kept this place secure. He made it secure and protected so that revelation could be sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the Quraysh refused to obey these commandments and worship their Lord, and they fought the Muslims, persecuted and killed them, Allah punished them, the Muslims were given victory by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not because of their great numbers and power, but only by Allah's power and mercy, and so the Muslims were able to go back to Mecca to purify the holy place, remove the idols and pictures and statues that had been placed there by generations of Arab people who came to worship at this place. And Mecca is dedicated solely to the worship of Allah, the one who placed it there by a miracle and has kept it safe and secure for 1,400 years as the center of Islam the Qibla toward which all of us face in our Salat is safe and secure and the people who are there till this day are respected throughout the world and they enjoy also the security and safety and so this is also a lesson and warning to us and them and anybody who visits the shrine and sanctuary of Mecca who stays there for a short time or spends their entire lifetime there that when you're there in the holy places your good deeds are multiplied thousands of times, 10,000 times, 100,000 times what they would be elsewhere and at the same time though you're held responsible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you disobey Him in this holy place this place which is by itself a miracle then Allah is going to take you to account and you're going to receive uh, a punishment much greater than somebody who was living far away who never had visited these places and seen them with his own eyes and so you have to be um, conscientious that Allah has given great miracle and favor to this place and treat it with respect and veneration only worshiping Allah not committing shirk not associating any other partners with Allah not raising your hands in dua mentioning the names of other people uh, praying in the names of other people of walis or saints or prophets but only praying and making your dua to Allah alone while you're in the holy the holy part of Mecca. And so these two surahs uh, are examples of physical things which can be seen by people. Allah could have revealed this Quran and only given us, for example, 
uh, believe in Allah, the last days, pray and fast. But he gives us physical things that we can see as witness, as signs of the truth of this message. And the Kaaba itself is one of those things. Of course, the Kaaba has been rebuilt on several occasions since the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can see the original stones that were placed there by Abraham and Ismail in the foundation stones of the Kaaba. If you go up there, inshallah, yourself, Allah will grant you to make a Hajj or Umrah, um, the major pilgrimage or the minor pilgrimage. Uh, when you're in the front of the Kaaba by the door, you can, you can see the, uh, the original stones uh, along close to the ground. You see in the picture that the Kaaba is built of stone, but it's covered every year with a silk veil, which is called the Kiswa, which is the veil of the Kaaba, which shows the respect of the Holy Sanctuary, which has been done continuously since long before the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when you look at the door, stand before the door, uh, the, if, the, if you're close to the, the, the Kaaba, the place of Abraham was r- very close to the door. It's been moved back farther now. So it will be behind you. Look toward the ground. You'll see the white um, uh, foundation at an angle to the ground, and you'll see different small stones. Those were found underneath the Kaaba when it was rebuilt uh, you know, more than 500 years ago when it was, was repaired, and they dug up the foundations, and they took those original stones, and they placed those right there. And so those stones look a little bit different than the stones that are currently there in the Holy, Holy Kaaba. So anyway, the Kaaba is a sign of Allah's grace and mercy to Abraham and Ismail and to Ismail's mother Hagar, who depended on Allah for food and drink, and Allah brought her and, and her son water from the well of Zemzem and brought her people who would care for them and support them. And ever since, anybody who has lived in Mecca has been supported and cared for by all the Muslims of the world. And so we need to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the city of Mecca as the Quraysh needed. And because the Quraysh rejected this message, so they were rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for joining us for Universal Quran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وترى الجبال تحسبها جامدة وهي تمر مر السحاب صنع الله الذي أتقن كل شيء إنه خبير بما تفعلون مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون